it's my great pleasure to introduce Danny Sheehan. Well, that was that was just in response to well, was asking me what should he say to introduce me. I said just tell him I'm a clean living guy. Uh, but <laughs> so so listen now, uh, as uh, yesterday's a uh, panel uh, that, you, that you were all at, you, you'll notice that in the final statements that the, the various people were making that John Perkins, who's up in the other room right now, talking, said in his final statement, he said, Look, what we ought to do is engage in a certain kind of thought experiment of, you know, a, a, a vastly advanced extraterrestrial civilization actually having successfully figured out how to engage in superluminal travel or to transfer themselves here, hovering over our planet, cloaked from our, our vision, wondering what, it's, what we're like and whether or not we're actually uh, worthy of them coming down and, as he said, making love with us, uh, that we will settle for less uh, if they if they <laughs> just coming and having some type of communication uh, with us. Uh, but this, this echoed the, my initial remarks at the very beginning of our gathering here this weekend in which I pointed out to you that I thought that the, the actual way in which the new paradigm is going to come into manifestation is by the combination of two things going on at the same time. One is this, this program of reaching out and discovering more and more and more of the exoplanets and step-by-step uh, step discovering more and more complex life on these exoplanets. Uh, and at the same time that this process was going on, reaching ultimately a point of acknowledging that there was, in fact, another highly intelligent and highly technologically developed uh, but distinctly non-human uh, species uh, just in our own galaxy, that that's where they would eventually get to in this revelation, uh, feathering in this realization to our people. At the same time, however, that there would be ongoing this conversation, uh, this profound conversation uh, about the, the fundamental questions, philosophical and theological, uh, that are posed to us as our human family uh, by such a discovery. Uh, and uh, what, what, I, what I wanted to do today is uh, I wanted to, to move on to the, to the discussion of you know, what this new paradigm worldview might look like. But if we're going to be the architects uh, of this new paradigm, I thought that it, at first it was important for us to get an idea of what the architecture of a new of a paradigm or worldview actually looks like. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, just review with you quickly uh, what what the uh, the what a worldview is so that we have a, a clear understanding of what it is that we're actually talking about. I touched upon it briefly uh, yesterday morning, but there are a number of descriptions, and we, we go to the normal sources for these of the dictionaries and others, and they say that a worldview is the basic way of perceiving and interpreting reality around us that comes eventually to persuade an entire culture uh, so thoroughly that it becomes the entire culture's concept of reality itself, uh, including such issues as what is good or bad, what is right and wrong, what is real and what isn't real. Uh, uh, and they, they go on to identify these and uh, one after another, saying things like uh, a worldview is the overall perspective from which a person sees and interprets the world and her, her or his reality. A uh, collection of beliefs about life in the universe held by an individual or a group, uh, a comprehensive uh, concept or image or model of the universe that a given group uses to address the common problems of their life. Uh, and this, as it turns out, is the same thing uh, as a paradigm. Because when you look up the, the definitions of paradigm, it says things like a set of assumptions, concepts, or beliefs that constitute a way of viewing reality for the specific community that shares them. And that the purpose of a paradigm is, however, not to take an audience to a specific conclusion, as I pointed out, 
However, it is used to guide them to such a conclusion. Uh, and these are, so that in fact, I'll just throw that aside. Uh, that, 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 uh, so, so in fact, you see that a worldview and a paradigm turn out to be the same thing. And uh, as I pointed out in my earlier remarks, that I came to, the, to discover that there was an entire uh, scholastic uh, endeavor of dealing with worldviews and what they're like and how they go about perceiving them. And I pointed out just briefly uh, in our initial uh, conversation together what the structure of the, such a, a worldview was. And uh, so I wanted to just refresh your recollection at the beginning of our talk today about this uh, in that there, there are what they call four fundamental pillar beliefs uh, that undergird the platform uh, on which a worldview is built. If we're thinking in the, uh, in the metaphor of uh, architects, uh, that the, the pillars are the cosmological, the answer that an individual person or a community provides to the cosmological question of how the universe actually came into being. And you'll notice that this issue surfaces periodically in the conversations during the weekend, that people keep asking, these questions of, of Nassim and others. And here you find all of the people on the panel basically talking about this issue of how the universe came into being. Uh, was there, in fact, a Big Bang that initiated this entire process? Or is there some other means that it, by which it came into existence? I want to talk about some of those different views uh, that uh, generate different worldviews here today. Uh, but the second, the second question, was, second pillar question was, the teleological question of is our universe unfolding in any type of predictable or discernible way moving towards some specific end result, thereby providing some type of meaning uh, to our, our universe. Uh, then the third question is the ontological question, which is how consciousness came into being. If one assumes that the, whatever the process that initiated the universe, or if the universe has been perpetually in existence, you know, what, what, how is it that uh, with all of these rocks and stones and different elements, how is it that consciousness actually came into existence, even in this kind of primitive forms of the consciousness of, a, of an amoeba that knows enough to seek out uh, light or food, et cetera? Uh, how, does this, how does this happen? Uh, uh, that's a, that's a, a, a profound question that, that afflicts our, our human family for, for our entire uh, existence. Uh, and then the fourth, the fourth and the final pillar question is what we referred to as the epistemological question. That is, what, what are the means that we have at our disposal as human beings by means of which we can possibly answer cosmic questions like that? Uh, are we, in fact, confined to the exercise of our so-called five senses uh, that the scientific community con has a consensus about, about our seeing and hearing and tasting and touching, uh, et, et cetera, uh, even, as I mentioned, amplified by our technology uh, of telescopes and microscopes uh, in cyclotrons and, and the other technologies that we've developed, uh, or, or, in fact, do we have uh, some additional faculty or faculties uh, as a human species that are in the process of evolving. And uh, you, you may have read things about this, the, the evolution of consciousness. Uh, Teilhard de Chardin is one of the more well-known authors about this. He's a Jesuit priest who was a, a paleontologist who discovered Peking man, actually. Uh, and he wrote uh, enough about this to, to get himself silenced uh, by the Catholic Church. Uh, talking about this being the actual process that was going on. Uh, and Benedict, uh, uh, Pope Benedict, uh, actually as the head of the, the uh, Institute for, uh, for belief, the, the beliefs in the Catholic Church, uh, actually silenced him uh, because he didn't want this being talked about. Because, because uh, Tehard was basically implying that Jesus and the Buddha and, and Lao Tzu and others who have been, who have come to be viewed by our human family as prophets, uh, that they, that Teilhard was suggesting that they are somehow mutations, that they're mutations that have 
have occurred uh, out of time, that uh, in the slow evolution of consciousness in our human species, they have sort of leaped into uh, full manifestation uh, prematurely, uh, and that the environment was not favorable uh, to them. Uh, and, uh, and they get crucified and tortured and buried and uh, other things that happens uh, to them. Uh, but, but the implication is, is that this is a process that is going on inside our human species and that all of us are evolving toward that particular point. Uh, and that was not acceptable to the church because if that were true, then what's the point of the church? Uh, being there to tell you what's right and wrong, and, and et cetera. So that th these, these are the four questions, uh, these pillar questions. And as I pointed out, if in fact one answers each of those questions in a way that is internally and self-referentially consistent with the answers that you've provided to the other three, what that does is it raises up through that inductive process a principle which if, if extended out constitutes a mode of ethical reasoning. And if you apply that principle that is generated by your common answers to these four questions, uh, that you will have a principle that can guide you uh, in making decisions when you encounter the day-to-day -day problems or challenges that we have in the world uh, as to what principles we're going to use to guide our choice among alternative solutions to particular concrete problems. That, that we encounter. Uh, and so that I've, I've talked about that with you and I pointed out that, that if you apply this principle or mode of ethical reasoning to a, an adequately large series of particular questions, that it will generate a philosophy. And derivative of that philosophy is a political philosophy. Uh, and so th this is where we, I think, can, can realistically begin our conversation here today because this is, this is the, uh, the one of the manifestations of a worldview that has become uh, most talked about uh, among people. Uh, in that, that what, we, what we see is, and I mentioned to you that Talcott Parsons, who was the, the uh, founder of the Department of Sociology at Harvard University and was there for some 40 years, developed the, the uh, right-left spectrum, the political spectrum or sociological uh, spectrum that, that we want to work with here today and that what we, what we see is, as I pointed out to you, and I, I, this may be hard for some of you to see here, I'm sorry about that, this seems to be the best we can do here, but I pointed out that what, what Talcott Parsons discovered by sending out his master's students and PhD students into the world in interviewing thousands and thousands of people, uh, he discovered that, uh, that if you can get the people to answer just a handful of questions, and they can be questions about their political views, about their views of, of, on abortion or, or first strike nuclear weapons or the death penalty I mentioned to you, that if you can get uh, the answers to a few of these key questions from a person, then he discovered that you can predict uh, very accurately how that same person is likely to answer a series of a whole hundred different questions uh, because it's reflective of their worldview. And what he did is he discovered that when our human family is confronted by a particular public policy question or a question that we have to collectively figure out what to do about, that our, our family, our human family, divides ourselves into basically five different subgroups. Uh, that he just generally characterized as the, as the right systematists uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, left systematists and then left marginalists and right marginalists. And you can see that this was rather vague at the beginning and then he had the whole group he called middle marginalists. Now, that uh, Ralph Potter, one of his PhD students uh, back in the the early mid 60s actually tried to figure out you know if if these if he's got these five different groups what was it what was it that caused a person to fall into one or another of these five groups uh, the, what what were the particular beliefs that a person has about these major questions and that's how that's how these four pillar questions ended up getting identified that Ralph Potter is the one who actually 
discerned these four pillar questions uh, and, uh, and went about uh, identifying them. Uh, and then pursuant to this, he, he's written his entire PhD thesis. I, men I mentioned to you earlier, I ended up being there uh, at Harvard University to do a master's and PhD study on this issue of comparative social ethics. These are particularly distinct social ethical systems that these worldviews generate here. Uh, and what, what, uh, what I discovered in doing my thesis on it, the, what we were supposed to do for our master's thesis, we were supposed to take a particular issue, for example, like the issue of the death penalty, uh, and that we were supposed to then uh, explicate what the different positions were that different groups had taken on this and try to understand what their beliefs were that caused them to come to that conclusion. So rather than my take uh, one of these particular public policy problems, uh, you know, I, I decided I wanted to do an evaluation of the chart itself, and I came to the conclusion that there were, there were in fact, instead of five, there were seven of these basic positions. So that there was, in fact, in addition to a right systematist and right marginalist position, there was a right middle marginalist position and a left middle marginalist position. Now, that doesn't mean anything to anybody in, in its general terms like that, but if, in fact, you understand that when you look through the, the uh, political philosophy of these particular positions, you discover that what you're getting here, you're getting the authoritarian worldview on the extreme right. You move one, one step to the left and you get the reactionary worldview. And you move one more step to the left here and you get the conservative worldview. Then you get the moderate worldview, and that's the middle marginalist, middle marginalist, moderate worldview. Then you get the liberal worldview, and then you get the progressive worldview, and then you get this utopian worldview. And th these, are, these are classic uh, political philosophies that people have run into over, over the years, and they, we've become quite familiar with these. And we, can recognize people uh, who fall into these areas, like you know, an authoritarian. As we mentioned, that a lot you hear a lot of discussion about this uh, with regard to Donald Trump, when he says, "I'm the only one that can possibly save us. Uh, I'm the one that can solve this problem. Uh, I am a, an authoritative, authoritarian individual person. I can m wade into the chaos and 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 make sense out of the the chaos that you can't. All you mere mortals." Uh, that, and uh, then there are reactionaries. Reactionaries, uh, and, and we're going we're to get into a discussion of what the actual beliefs are uh, of people who adhere to these different worldviews as they pertain to these, these major uh, pillar worldviews here. And you'll see how this operates. And, and you, you can move all the way across. You know that, that, that unfortunately, for example, that, uh, that Hillary Clinton has become a moderate from the time that she was kind of a liberal and progressive in college. Uh, and in her early years, she ended up becoming the head of the uh, policy committee for the new, more moderate Democratic Party, uh, the head of the Democratic Leadership Conference uh, policy committee after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and, and, you, and you get liberals, classic liberals, uh, the uh, United States Senator, for example, from New York uh, now, Chuck Schumer, a classic liberal, uh, and you get people like Barbara Boxer from California. You get the two senators uh, from Oregon here. They're, they're classic liberals. You can predict pretty much what they're going to do on things. And then you have progressives. There is a, a progressive caucus, actually, in the House of Representatives. Uh, and it, you have, of course, Bernie Sanders, uh, kind of the leader of the progressive caucus now, uh, and 72 other members, uh, not coincidentally, almost every one of which comes from a congressional district with a large university where people read books uh, <laughs> and uh, have, 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 have discussions such as we're all having here th this weekend. Uh, and then there are, the, there are the utopians, the utopians. And you've heard a lot about these utopian communities that have developed. And we, we see a, a number of them actually still with the pioneers and the people that are, in, in fact, up here. They're, there are a few uh, people engaged in this process up around here.
apparently they just purchased uh, the town of Tiller or something, and they're, they're talking about having kind of this utopian community there. Uh, and the, and the, they, they usually tend to be theological, that uh, you, know, you, you hear all about the Hutterites and the, the, other, the, other, the Quakers uh, had uh, communities like that, and there are uh, the, the ones, the ones in, in New York uh, that you know drive little horse and carriages around the the the, uh, the Amish, you know. So so there there are those those types of communities. But what what I want to what I want to do is all of this is by way of kind of a general discussion about what this looks like. What what people would really like to know is what what is it, for example, that it makes an authoritarian uh, worldview. What what is the cosmology of a of an authoritarian worldview? For example, this this cosmology, the cosmology of the authoritarians, is one of the Big Bang. That the the Big Bang, they say, uh, it just came out of nowhere. There's no particular uh, speculation as to what preceded it, uh, but it just happened. Uh, the Big Bang has happened, and they recognize that the universe is expanding out and away from the locus of the Big Bang, uh, and that every single element in the entire periodic chart uh, is disintegrating at the same time. It's disintegrating at the, its, its own specific rate of atomic breakdown that we all remember this sort of from high school uh, chemistry and physics that every one of the elements has its own distinct uh, rate of atomic breakdown. And that therefore they, they perceive the universe, the cosmology of this is it coming into existence out of a big bang expanding out and away from the locus of the Big Bang and constantly disintegrating. And that begins to generate the teleology of this. The teleological worldview is that the universe, the way it's unfolding, is that it's ultimately expanding and disintegrating. And that every single element will eventually disintegrate into its smallest constituent parts uh, that get all the way down into, for example, a quantum field. Uh, this in, inchoate quantum field uh, in which the, the, if, you, if you split uh, an atom and then you split the, the protons and you split them into meons and, uh, and muons and, and leptons and you keep on colliding them together uh, in the big cyclotrons and they will eventually break down to the point where they fall into a, an inchoate quantum field. It's a, it's a field in which it has no material manifestation. It's just there as an inchoate uh, field. And what it does is it, 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 it jumps into material manifestation as a wave of energy and then disappears again. Uh, and it will then jump into material reality as a particle of mass. Uh, and, and, then, and it keeps on doing that. And it does so completely randomly. They've, they've investigated this at great length, and they, they can discern no discernible or predictable pattern pursuant to which these inchoate quantum fields will manifest either as a particle of mass or a unit of uh, energy, a wave of energy. But, but what happens is that the, the, the uh, teleology, the teleological belief of the authoritarians is that this process is going to keep going on and on until ultimately every single element in the entire universe uh, every single particle of every uh, every element in the universe has disintegrated into its constituent uh, inchoate quantum fields, and in fact, they will eventually uh, expand out and away from each other to the point where they will dissipate uh, into the into the far reaches of space, uh, in that there will be no universe left. Uh, it just dissolves and disappears into its individual inchoate quantum fields. Uh, now, as you might guess, that's kind of a bummer. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, does not, not, it doesn't hold out high prospects uh, for the future. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the, in the, the ontological point of view of these, the opinion of these people is that the consciousness is nothing more than merely the random epiphenomenon of the random interaction of mass and energy in the universe. It just there are certain confluences of mass and energy that come together, and uh, just as a physical mechanical result, it generates a phenomenon that is consciousness. Uh, and uh, and they, they, the reason they believe this is because their epistemological belief is that, that the fact is that there's no real way 
of knowing anything uh, other than you're being able to see it and hear it and taste it and touch it, uh, that, that we're confined to our own five senses in order to discern information. You can process it through your intellect and try to, to make sense of it, but the fact of the matter is these are the, these are the cosmological, teleological, ontological, and epistemological assumptions uh, of the answers to these, five, these four pillar questions. I hasten to point out at this point that it is extremely important to remember this all the way through all of these different worldviews, this entire octave of worldviews here, is that nobody knows the definitive answer to these questions. So that the fact that, the fact that they, they guess at these questions or make some sort of judgment as to how they're going to run their life, that, they, that unconsciously they will come to a certain conclusion about these questions predicated upon whatever information they can get through the particular epistemological methodology that they believe to be the only legitimate one that we have at our disposal, and that they will, they will guess at these answers, and they'll, they'll go forward predicated upon those guesses. And the same thing is true, and this is, this is one of the most ultimately important issues that I'm going to talk about today, is that it's essential to remember that everybody is making a kind of an educated guess as to what these answers are. So that, you know, when you get up and get, a, get on your horse and get self-righteous with somebody uh, who has got a different set of assumptions about all of this, if pressed, you aren't going to be able to prove that your estimate of these answers is right and theirs is wrong. So you ought to calm down a little bit uh, <laughs> about this. Uh, people have mentioned that to me, uh, that uh, I ought to calm down a little bit on this. But... But it's, but it's important. It's important uh, with regard to having compassion and concern and caring for other people who have come to different conclusions uh, about these things. Now, for example, we moved one step to the to the left here of the of the right systematists and the right marginalists or reactionaries. Their their answer to the cosmological question is that yes, the the, the universe originated with a uh, could, can be conceived of of originating with a Big Bang. But the fact is that when it gets all the way out to that same spot where every single uh, element has disintegrated into its constituent uh, inchoate quantum fields and has expanded out and away from the locus of the Big Bang and they stand separate and apart from each other, that at that particular point, the impetus that was imposed upon them by the, by the Big Bang becomes exhausted and there is a degree of attraction of every single inchoate quantum field for every other one. This is that another thing that we learned in high school physics is that, that every integer of matter in the universe is attracted to every other integer of matter in the entire universe. That uh, the degree of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That's one of those things we remembered, whether we understood it or not. Uh, that, that, but that's, that, that, that's what they believe. They believe that at that particular point when the impetus for expansion imposed upon each of the particles by the Big Bang is exhausted, there will still remain this bonding attraction that exists among all the different uh, integers. And at that point, they will start collapsing back in upon each other and that they will then start regrouping back up into electrons and, and, uh, or muons and leptons and electrons and protons and neutrons and, and then, uh, then uh, elements and compounds and mixtures and they will eventually generate stars and planets and galaxies uh, but instead of expanding out and away from each other they're all drawing together and they will continue to draw together all the way to the point where eventually every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire universe, these inchoate quantum fields will in fact be in direct physical contact with every other one. And this is that thing that you keep hearing about, uh, reading in the New York Times magazines about the latest uh, theories. What, they're, what they assert is at that point, the entire physical universe exists as the size of the head of a pin. And that at that exact micromillisecond, the polarity immediately reverses and they all repel each other. Uh, instead of attracting each other, and that, that it doesn't explode from the center out, it explodes in a, a particular way of 
every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter repelling every other one. Thus, the incredible impetus of the Big Bang that occurs. And as soon as they move out and away from each other at that initial micromillisecond, the polarity reverses, and they're attracted to each other, but the impetus that's been imposed upon them continues to move them out and out and out. And so what happens here is that the, the teleological assumption of the right marginalists or reactionaries is that, the, that our universe oscillates. It oscillates between a state of what would be ultimate energy and ultimate mass. And in between each of those two points of absolute manifestation, that our universe exists just as a confluence of mass and energy at different ratios. Uh, and that this goes on. They, they refer to this as the, as the grand year or the magnum annus or the magnum periodo or, or period uh, of the, this oscillation of the universe. Uh, and what, in the, the, ontological, the ontological assumptions uh, of this is the same, is that, that the fact is that there are various uh, generations of consciousness uh, in these different confluences of mass and energy in the, in the expansion and contraction process. Uh, and that that, that, that uh, epistemological set of beliefs that they come up with is a very important difference here because epistemologically, the adherence to the right systems, this worldview, as I mentioned, believe that you cannot really uh, discern much about ultimate reality because all you have is what you can see and touch and taste and feel and experience directly through your own five senses. Uh, but what happens is in the, in the reactionary worldview that there is a basic uh, epistemological assumption that we are capable of discerning this oscillation in the universe, that there is this ultimate state of mass and, uh, mass and energy and it's going back and forth between the two of them. So there is, in fact, some ultimate referent that it is not a world of complete chaos. Uh, because in, the, in the, the right systematists, they believe that the world is just chaos, that it's just disintegrating and dissipating into the universe. And therefore, the, the, there has to be some sort of authoritarian uh, power that basically lends coherence to what is otherwise an incoherent universe that you need to have a strong-willed individual who can impose, usually his, uh, uh, views uh, onto the world to lend meaning and, cre and, and credence to, the, to reality. Whereas in the second paradigm worldview, in the reactionary worldview, what they believe is that if you're looking for meaning in the world, what you do is you attach yourself to one or another of two fundamentally dialectically opposing uh, forces that are going on. This is the one that we live with all the time still at our present state of incarnation. You know, the, you have March Madness going on uh, right now, you know, with uh, North Carolina, you know, playing uh, Georgia and, and uh, the blue team playing the red team. Uh, you know, they, they get a little pigskin and they push it up and down the field you know, uh, with, you know, the, the New England Patriots, you know, playing the Los Angeles Rams, you know, and, and so and the, this goes on all the time. And it's, a, and it's this dialectical conflict that goes on. Uh, and pursuant to this worldview, that the, it, it turns out that their mode of ethical reasoning that is generated is one of dialectical conflict is that that's, that's the only way that you can possibly determine what is right and wrong or true or not is by a conflict between two antipodal forces and that they end up conflicting with each other and that they eventually generate a synthesis between the two which becomes its own new operating thesis which generates its own new antithesis and that they will then continue to conflict with each other and you can never get to any kind of ultimate insight into reality other than the fact that there is this bipolar oscillation going on and that if and to lend meaning to your life that you take part in one side or another of this fundamental conflict uh, you know, like the legal system that's right <laughs> oh, like like the adversarial legal system in fact uh, it, it becomes absurd uh, to some extent I don't want to you know shed disparaging uh, remarks about this particular worldview but but the, the, but the bottom line is is that Therefore, neither one of the sides really cares about what's true. You know, they just say whatever they think they can get away with, uh, and as long as you don't catch them, it's the same as being truthful. 
Uh, and so the, this, this particular uh, worldview uh, generates uh, a particular mode of ethical reasoning. The ethical reasoning of the right systemist worldview is that since there's no, no coherence to anything, the bottom line is the mode of ethical reasoning is to pursue your own immediate self-gratification. You know, because if there's no meaning in the universe and it's all ultimately just disintegrating, the mode of ethical reasoning is to maximize your own personal uh, short-term immediate gratification uh, in lust for power, uh, lust for money and riches and fame and celebrity. Uh, th th those, are the kind of, those are the kind of things that engine and drive one's ethical reasoning. Uh, and, and, but in the reactionary worldview, the, the second paradigm worldview, there is a teaming up, that you become part of a team and you are engaged in a meaningful exercise of trying to vanquish the ultimate other constantly. Uh, and if, in fact, you end up vanquishing one particular ultimate other, you have to quickly generate a new one, uh, as you saw happen at the end of the Cold War. Uh, you know, as, as soon as the Soviet Union and Mikhail Gorbachev just said, look, we don't want to play anymore in this. Uh, we're going to dissolve. We're going to uh, agree not to engage in nuclear conflict with you. You know, we knew, we knew, the, those of us that were in the Gorbachev uh, Foundation, the State of the World Forum, we had to get uh, world leaders together as fast as we could to try to come up with some new paradigm. I headed up the project uh, to identify the new paradigm. Uh, we would invite all the former, now retired, world presidents and vice presidents and secretaries of state and uh, et cetera to, to the uh, annual gatherings that we had at the Fairmont Hotel uh, in San Francisco, the same place where the United Nations was founded at the end of World War II. And we're, and we're trying to have this discussion about what kind of a new paradigm that we could generate. And I was fortunate enough to chair those meetings of the, the former presidents and, and secretaries of state, et cetera. But we knew very well that there was a short window to that. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, the Bush administration, the Bush senior administration, ends up sending a, uh, well, George Bush himself sent a handwritten memo to uh, Saddam Hussein uh, saying, oh, by the way, I know that you're having a, an ongoing dispute with Kuwait on your southern border, uh, and you believe that they're slant drilling under your border and in, in stealing uh, Iraqi oil. I just wanted to let you know in this hand-delivered, handwritten memo delivered by April Gillespie, our, our ambassador to Iraq, she hands it personally to Saddam Hussein, and it says, if, in fact, you find it necessary to resort to the use of military force, uh, I just want you to know that I will not view that as contrary to the long-term best interests of the United States. Uh, and to no one's great surprise, uh, Saddam Hussein mobilizes 10,000 Iraqi troops and sends them to their southern border. <coughs> and uh, and, and uh, George H.W. Bush's uh, Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, uh, immediately contacts, uh, I, I was just discussing this uh, last night with one of our people here, that you know, immediately uh, Dick Cheney sends a message to Prince Bandar, who is the ambassador of the United States from Saudi Arabia, asking him to come to the White House and says, oh, we have information that Saddam Hussein is getting ready to invade Kuwait and occupy them. And uh, we have equally trustworthy intelligence that after he occupies Kuwait, he's going to go into Saudi Arabia and he's going to be trying to oust the House of Saud and, and take over there. So. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to invoke a secret treaty that, we, uh, that was signed by Richard Nixon uh, and Henry Kissinger back in August of 1972, many years ago, 10 years ago almost by that time, uh, in which while well, on the way back from China uh, in doing the secret opening to China, flying on the SR-71 Blackbird, that they stopped in Saudi Arabia, met at that time with King Faisal, uh, and struck a deal. That they would agree. It's a long and involved story, but uh, but but the bottom line is that, that is what ended up resulting in the U.S. invasion of the Middle Eastern oil fields and the occupation of the Middle Eastern oil fields in generating this huge jihad uh, on the part of the Islamic other uh, Muslim Brotherhood, actually, uh, trying to throw them out of the Holy Lands, uh, and that's what's still going on to this day. And no matter what you keep wanting to call them, whether they're they're ISIS or uh, Al-Qaeda or uh, whichever one you might want to suggest, it's the Muslim Brotherhood. 
they're going to throw them out of the Middle East, and they'll go to whatever lengths they need to to get that done. And so therefore, now they have a new ultimate other. So now they can justify a $56 million increase in the military budget, uh, even though the Soviet Union has uh, dissolved itself now. Uh, and so that there's this constant quest on the part of people who are adherents to the second paradigm reactionary worldview to have some ultimate other against whom to struggle, because that is how they find their own sense of self-worth uh, in an otherwise potentially meaningless universe. So this is, these are the, these are the, you can see these distinctions between these two particular worldviews. And then uh, you, you get to the, the third paradigm worldview. And, uh, and this, this mode of ethical reasoning, as I said, of the second paradigm worldview is that they can do nothing better than attach themselves to one side or another in a, in a dialectic. Uh, and the, because the problem is that they believe that this mechanistic expansion and contraction is unchangeable, that it will just happen all the time. And it just goes on over and over again, and there's nothing that we can do about it. It's an objective reality that's going on. All we can do is accommodate ourselves to that. Whereas in the third paradigm worldview, uh, whereas this, this oscillating universe is going on, they happen to believe that consciousness, consciousness actually is a third element uh, in the universe. That, there is, that it is more than just an epiphenomenon of the interaction at random of mass and energy. They believe that consciousness is a, an element from the perspective of which we can actually make uh, existential choices. We can make choices to intervene in this otherwise mechanical, predetermined uh, oscillation of the universe that we can actually, from a perspective of our intellect, our, our consciousness, we can intervene and undertake to assert will and power and that we can attempt to change what is ultimately a, uh, another just a dial ongoing dialectic. This is, this is the, of course, when you get down into the analysis of it, what generates the existentialist uh, belief system is that you, know, that you can, in fact, make an existential choice to exercise your will in a manner to break out of, in some sense, this, uh, this endless oscillation of between the, the good guys and the bad guys in the, uh, A versus B, uh, that you can somehow transcend it through an act of will. That these are, that this is, that let, let's, let's go to the other end of the of this spectrum to get an idea of how, how these compare uh, with each other and contrast with each other. You come over here to the, to the seventh paradigm worldview here. This is, this is the, the seventh paradigm worldview here. Here's the sixth paradigm worldview. The seventh paradigm worldview, this utopian worldview, what, what adherents to the utopian worldview believe is that, in fact, the, our universe uh, originated out of an enfoldment into material manifestation of an otherwise completely infinite and eternal sea of undifferentiated consciousness. That, that outside of the parameters of our present universe, our present material universe, with all the dark matter and everything else that we're, we're discovering, that exterior to the exterior parameters of our universe abides an infinite and eternal sea of undifferentiated consciousness, which enfolded into being actual consciousness itself, that the original inchoate quantum field uh, in the universe was actually a condensation of consciousness. And therefore, every single one of the inchoate quantum fields, when it is not materially manifest as a wave of energy or a particle of mass, is in fact consciousness. It is, it is a holographic subfunction of the infinite and eternal consciousness. Uh, and therefore, all material in the universe is shot through with consciousness. Uh, and that, in fact, it loses sight of its, of its uh, unitary consciousness with the infinite and eternal uh, by a, a, an increasing condensation of more and more particles to the point where they begin to develop a, what they experience as a separate consciousness from the infinite and eternal consciousness, that there's enough of these that have come together that they end up having a, a field that they generate among themselves that causes them to view themselves, experience themselves as a separate entity, separate and apart from the infinite and eternal sea of consciousness. 
and that this is this is the dynamic that we're faced with as human beings that we are a collective of mass and energy that has in fact exp we experience ourselves as separate and apart from the infinite and eternal consciousness uh, and that the theory of this is that the quest is for us to find our way back to find our way back into unity with the infinite and eternal consciousness uh, but this is this is, as you can see, a profoundly, dare we say, categorically different, may we even say paradigmatically different uh, worldview uh, from, from the, the right systematist authoritarians. And that this particular view uh, is that, that we actually, their, their epistemological view is that our human species actually has an additional faculty, which is able to directly encounter the infinite and eternal uh, and that we can discern truth from the infinite and eternal state of consciousness that shows the relativity of all of the rest of the manifestations of the material universe uh, and, and this compares with the sixth paradigm worldview which which is what we refer to as the radical monist worldview and in this particular worldview here this is extraordinarily important because the, you'll see, we're starting to notice that the, the differences in epistemology or the belief system of what, how we go about discerning reality is what differentiates these different worldviews. That, uh, that in this particular worldview, the sixth paradigm worldview, the adherents believe that, that we have a sixth faculty, that we have a sixth faculty uh, that, uh, that, uh, that this progressive worldview uh, there's, this is, there's, there's the fifth over here, which is the liberals. What though? This is the fifth here, the sixth and seventh. That this, this worldview here, the radical monist worldview, believe that we have a faculty by means of which we can, and this is extremely important because though many people may not realize it, this is where a lot of the people are right now that are part of the progressive movement. That what they believe is that, that our human species possesses a sixth sense a faculty by means of which we can subtly discern the unitive phenomenon that bonds together every ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire universe. And that by this intuitive experience of this unitive phenomenon, we can discern what type of human conduct is either harmonious with or disharmonious to the natural order of the universe. And this is extremely important because this is the root of the natural law theory, which undergirds our entire United States Constitution. This whole concept that there is a, uh, a method, a, a mode of experience that human beings have that enable us to, to experience this tuning, this, this tuning fork, this kind, of, uh, this kind of resonant frequency that enables us to determine what is in what kind of individual conduct or collective conduct uh, enables us to, uh, to harmonize with the natural laws of the universe. And this is, this is extraordinarily important because this, interestingly enough, makes no particular assertions about what exists outside exterior to the boundaries of the universe. It does not speculate about uh, an infinite and eternal sea of consciousness. It does not, in fact, say that that you know you have to rely upon your access to this infinite consciousness to make judgments, uh, but in fact, what it asserts is that there is a, com a completely secular, biologically grounded uh, experience that human beings are capable of that enables us to make judgments about what type of conduct is harmonious with the natural order of being, uh, and this is this is the the uh, the the existent. A progressive worldview uh, right now and it's rooted in natural law it's why uh, you resort to the Constitution of the United States to look to the Bill of Rights uh, that acknowledges that we possess these fundamental rights as uh, as human beings that as human beings we're possessed of this unique uh, faculty of discernment uh, and therefore we each have the right and the responsibility to make individual choices of conscience conscience, conscience, a way of knowing. That's, that's what underlies this entire sixth paradigm progressive worldview. Uh, and you can, you can hear it 
uh, beneath what uh, Foster and Mary are saying, that there is this, this desire to make individual choices, uh, to be free from coercion from the state. Uh, but there's, a, there's this balance that's been struck in the United States Constitution between those who, in fact, are into asserting elitist power on the one hand, and yet recognizing individual liberties to some extent on the other. There's been a compromise that's been struck uh, in the United States Constitution uh, between adherence to uh, these different worldviews. And that's, that's why you can become an operative, as I have, of a constitutional litigator uh, that constantly struggles uh, against the unjust assertion of power on the part of the state uh, and on the part of the corporations uh, on behalf of the individual. Yet at the same time, recognizing that there needs to be some type of uh, authority that exists within the community to make decisions on behalf of the, the good of the whole community that may in fact restrict the ability of individuals from doing just absolutely anything they want to do. Uh, so, so this, so what you can see here is, is that there are there are profound uh, reasons why uh, different people adhere to different worldviews. So the que the question that arises, of course, uh, immediately, and I know you're getting set to ask this, uh, <laughs> is that you know what is it that causes a person to adhere to one of these worldviews rather than another one, right? Uh, now, th there's, there's some obvious uh, factors in this. Uh, for example, if a person is born, you know, in, in Alabama, uh, you know, in the 1920s, and you're entirely surrounded by your family and everybody else who are trying to get you to believe a certain type of reactionary worldview that scapegoats black people and, and uh, other minority groups, et cetera, and that you garner your own sense of self-worth from demeaning those people, uh, then it's very, that has a large influence on whether you're going to believe that. Uh, this is that, that uh, nurture thing. But there's another set of factors that they refer to as nature itself. And this, this is a, a more controversial aspect of this entire understanding of this, and that is you need to understand that, that there are insights that the spiritual communities have uh, about our possession of a whole set of chakras uh, in our body, these energy centers in our body. Uh, and if you, if you study the, the history of this uh, and the, the Hindu uh, understanding of this and Buddhist understanding of this, that these energy centers in our body uh, are all, and it's extremely important to remember, are all essential. That's another important thing to, to add to the fact that we have no definitive answers to these four pillar questions. There's this other, this other issue here, and that is, is that these chakra energy systems that we have in our body, that all of them are essential to the, to the healthy uh, functioning and survival of our human body. That you, know, you have your first ch chakra energy center, the red chakra energy center, which is, is clinging to life. It's, it's into survival and, and, uh, and, uh, and existing uh, and, and not dissipating back into the infinite and eternal consciousness. There, there's the, this whole incarnational uh, uh, drive that we have as individuals is rooted in the, in the root chakra. Uh, then the second chakra, the orange chakra they refer to, is a, is a, uh, a reproductive urge this constant uh, uh, desire to reproduce ourselves by mating with uh, another uh, member of our species and, and procreating and generating uh, energy. But you can see if that gets out of whack, if that ends up becoming over-dominant, what you do is you end up projecting this dialectical, confrontational dynamic in the world, uh, and it's equivalent to sexual lust, if you'll forgive me. Uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, those of us who have been subject to that uh, probably remember uh, what that's like. Most, uh, but but it's, a, it's this intense drive uh, to, to, to combine with or mate with another, but it can be distorted into confronting and differentiating yourself from another. Uh, and so that this, this second, the second chakra, the... the the, uh, it's, it's located in the gonads of, of each of us, 
And then there's a third chakra, the yellow chakra is in the power chakra. The, this is a, a will to power and dominion. Uh, this, is, this is that, again, that, that uh, as, uh, as uh, Foster pointed out, that uh, each one of us is uh, a champion swimmer uh, that has, uh, among all the competing sperm cells, made it to the fertilizing of the, the egg of our mother, uh, and that we, in fact, have, have this inclination to assert ourselves uh, and to dominate and win uh, in a very special way, that all of us are the product of those who have been successful in our ancestry in surviving, whereas others have not. So we, we have this strong power in our, in our bodies to, to survive, not only as an individual, but to survive as a species. And <clears throat> then we have the, the heart chakra, uh, and, as, as, and as we go through the, the list of the chakras. <clears throat> but this, this is, this is a, uh, one of the factors, along with the sociological uh, upbringing that a person has, having a major influence on what the balance of these chakras are. If, in fact, every single one of your chakra systems is functioning at the exact right frequency and at the exact right tip to the ecliptic, you know, that, in fact, you are a harmonious, uh, unified being. <clears throat> but if any of those are out and overactive or underactive, you tend to start inclining yourself toward conduct that is generic to that particular chakra system, okay? Okay. Now, then there are other factors, of course, that, uh, that you may or may not agree with, but, you know, that I think that I personally think that the evidence with regard to astrological inclinations is shockingly important. Uh, I mean, anyone who has actually sat down with a really experienced and sophisticated uh, astrologer, and they're going to sit there, they're going to tell you what your mate is like, they're going to tell you what your relationship is, what, you, what line of work you're in, you know, uh, what your political affiliations are, your attitudes toward authority. You know, and you're sitting here shocked, and you're saying to yourself, "Gee, I thought those were my idea," uh, but but it, but it turns out that there. And my own analysis of this is, is that, and the reason they want to know the exact longitude and latitude, or latitude actually, of where you were born, uh, is because that is usually and has been for thousands of years the place where you were gestated, so that from the point of the fertilization of the egg cell from which you evolved as a zygote. The fact is you have been in a very specific place on the planet that has been subjected to very specific tractor forces. Uh, and as you know, uh, the, the, just the moon itself can, drag, can pull trillions of tons of water on our planet off the one side of the planet every single day. You know? And so that these tractor forces that we are exposed to, uh, just like the radio waves coming through the room right now, et cetera, that, are going, that you don't discern at all, uh, but the, these, these tractor forces that are, you're subjected to during the actual physical development of your body uh, appear to have some type of effect upon you. And the, unless we have some perspective on what those inclinations are, uh, we think that we're making our own decisions, but we're not. Uh, and, of course, then we have the final one, is which your DNA. I mean, you, you have these, the, this DNA that has ge generated all kinds of attitudes and uh, forms of conduct and ways that you engage with the world uh, that you're not responsible for at all. But it would be really helpful to know what they are uh, so that when you, you get this completely unconscious urge to engage in a particular form of conduct, that you have some sense that it's being driven by your genetic coding. Now, so all, all of this is a, a bit of a digression, but. But it's a, it's a point that I'm trying to make, and, and that is, is that the, all of these go into helping to determine which of these particular worldviews you're likely to attach yourself to. And you will end up becoming quite convinced that the, the best answers, though not perfect, but the best answers to these four major pillar questions are those that have been tendered by the adherence to that particular worldview. And it, it makes sense of the world. It gives you a sense of meaning. It gives you a sense of context for these day-to-day -day decisions that you're, you're going to be making. Uh, and so that, that these are, these are the, the classic seven worldviews uh, that are the traditional worldviews uh, that, that range from the authoritarian to the reactionary to the conservative to the moderate to the liberal to the progressive to the utopian. 
And each one of these, as you'll see on this little chart, that uh, it, this isn't a perfect chart. Uh, this is one that I, I dictated uh, when I was driving up to Standing Rock with my staff. <laughs> uh, they, they were taking notes like mad to say, how, how are we going to uh, get these out in front of people? Th this is, a, this is a, a graphic representation of the various positions of the different uh, adherents to the worldviews. And at the bottom, you have what we call the lower manifestation of these worldviews. And up above is the higher manifestation of these worldviews. Because it becomes very important to understand that it's extremely difficult for us to marshal adequate evidence to convince someone that the answers to their four pillar questions are different than they think, because we can't prove that they are what we think they are. But you can, in fact, succeed in moving a person from the lower manifestation of their worldview to the higher manifestation. For example, in the second paradigm worldview, the lower manifestation of this the, uh, is a reactionary uh, political worldview of confronting the ultimate other, as I've pointed out. But in its higher manifestation, it is Taoist. It's the belief that there is a yin and a yang. There are, are forces that exist in the universe that there, they can be in synchronicity. They can, in fact, have a, a constructive dance together, the same way with male and female energies, that they can, in fact, engage in a pairing that generates uh, great, uh, something that's greater than the, two, the sum of the two. Um, and so that there, there is a, a lower and higher manifestation of each of these worldviews. For example, the authoritarian worldview is the lower manifestation of this worldview, but there is an authoritar authoritative worldview, which is the higher manifestation of that, which is, for example, like the myth of King Arthur, you know, that you have really benign uh, rulers at certain times in history, et cetera, that are totally caring for their people and totally magnanimous, uh, and that, that these are, that these are is a different, it's a different uh, manifestation of the same worldview. And so that the, when we get into the constructive discussion at the panel uh, later today, that I would point out that the, the task of helping, to someone, helping someone to elevate from the lower manifestation of his or her worldview into the higher manifestation of that worldview is a much easier lift, uh, as it were, uh, than, than trying to convert them to your worldview. Uh, because you aren't really going to be able to prove that your answers to these four definitive pillar questions are any better than theirs. Okay, so so this is a, this is all by way of a uh, an introduction to the question of what is the eighth paradigm worldview that completes this octave. Uh, th these these are the seven presently operative uh, worldviews, traditional worldviews, uh, and so that what I'm suggesting is <coughs> that the fundamental dynamic of looking for a new paradigm worldview is not to differentiate it just from the middle moderate worldview, which is a scientific, logical, positivist, materialist worldview of, of uh, the Newtonian Cartesian worldview of the scientists and the major universities now, and trying to supplant it with a sixth paradigm radical monist worldview uh, informed by quantum physics. Uh, that's not, in my opinion, the real, the real dynamic of the quest. What it really is is an attempt to try to finalize the eighth worldview uh, in this, because of, of all the great, all of the great uh, adepts will tell you that there is in fact an eighth chakra that our human species has. If you hold your, you extend your arm above your head and close your fist, right there is the eighth chakra, and it, and it abides at the at the top of the energy fields. Each of the chakras generates its own particular vibrational energy field which generates an envelope of subtle energy around your body. And that you take the seven of them all together and you have this, this multi-layered envelope of energy around your body. Uh, and if they're all in complete uh, harmony, <clears throat> then you're functioning well. And at the very top of this uh, egg of energy that exists around us is your eighth chakra. And what that appears, in, in my opinion, to do, that is our link to the next octave of being. And this is, this is where you're going to encounter uh, potential highly evolved other species in the universe, is that they vibrate at a, at a higher frequency, uh, and that they, in fact, have similar cartography or biology than, that we do, 
until such time as they move into an octave where they actually exist as light beams. You know? And so that there's, there's this entire cartography of life in the universe and that we happen to exist at a particular place in this cartography and it's important for us to begin to get an understanding of what that is because we don't want to go through the experience that virtually every primitive tribe uh, in our history has uh, that when in fact a more sophisticated technological society encounters them and finds them living in you know on an island in New Guinea and that they've had no contact with the outside world within a matter of one or two years their culture completely collapses because they discover that they've, they're at some primitive level of a lack of uh, insight uh, and their whole culture collapses and their, their whole people end up dissipating. Okay, and that, that, that I'm proposing as an advocate uh, that, uh, that we not go that route uh, in history, that we have to prepare for what's coming. That, that because uh, that even though the, those who are hovering in that, uh, that uh, veiled a spaceship looking down on us may not think that we're ready at the present time uh, to be their love mates. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, that our, we're engaged in this quest now of discovering the other life forms on the other planets and that much sooner than anyone expects, we're going to discover the existence of another highly intelligent and highly technologically developed uh, but distinctly non-human species in our galaxy and there's we're going to eventually encounter one that has developed the levels of technology that they're capable of traveling at superluminal uh, rates uh, or transferring their, their themselves to here and we're going to have direct communication with them dare I say intercourse uh, <laughs> with 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 them uh, and we we need to be prepared uh, we need to be prepared to how we're going to go about this. So that's, that's the, the quest that I think that we as architects of the new paradigm want to be engaged in. I don't think we want to be caught engaged in what is at base a dialectical struggle with the scientific, logical, positivist, materialist worldview, simply pairing up with those who are in the progressive community that in fact have this quantum uh, worldview, a radical monist worldview informed by the newest insights of quantum physics and, and be, but ultimately and unconsciously caught in a dialectic which is actually going to draw us back into partnership with the, re the second paradigm uh, reactionary. So we don't, we don't want to do that. I think we want to have this much more sophisticated understanding of what the full spectrum is of what our potential is at this particular level of incarnation that we are able to discern the we are able to discern aspects of a much larger reality that fall within a particular spectrum a particular octave actually that we're, we're able to hear vibrational frequencies that are within a certain range and we're not able to hear those that are above or below uh, we're able to see light wave frequencies that are at a particular frequency uh, and not see those that are above and below. You know, and, and so that, but we, we exist in a, in a, a vast sea of, of stimuli and phenomena in data and reality that we're not <laughs> immediately cognizant of through our, our senses, our, our present five senses. But in the exact same way that ad adherence to the sixth paradigm worldview believe that there is a sixth sense, this extrasensory perception system that we have for precognition in telepathy and others that we're, we're quite familiar with. The indications are that there, are, there is in fact a seventh faculty, which may well, we may well be experiencing as having access to the direct infinite and eternal consciousness. And there may well be an eighth faculty that we have as human beings, which is generic to the eighth paradigm worldview. And that that is what brings us to full fruition as human beings, and that we then move into the, 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 next, the next paradigm of our existence in which we, in fact, evolve into a higher frequency being, and that we then progress through the, through the spectrum of reality. Uh, and that this may well be what it is that we're dealing with, 
This may well be what the news is that's going to be shared with us by an extraterrestrial civilization, that they're not here to interrupt our present our development. We have to complete this development ourselves. But it helps to know what it is. It helps to know what the, what the actual uh, the cartography is of the evolution that we're engaged in because we can consciously assist in accelerating this evolution. And that is one of the secrets that's around. It's an open secret in our human family. It's been around for thousands of years that if, in fact, we are willing to sit down and, and regularly engage in an exercise of breathing and meditating, that we're, we're able to control our own diet, you know, to the point where we're not, you know, knocking other mammals in the head and tearing their leg off and eating it. Uh, if, if, we, if, we, uh, if we, you know, stop imbibing in all kinds of things that are vastly stimulating to us, but deadening us to the more sensitive uh, experience of other realms and vibrational frequencies, we can accelerate our own individual evolution and we can accelerate our, the evolution of our entire human family. You know? But we have to be guarded because there's always this temptation to fall into institutionalizing of those belief systems, uh, trying to dumb them down to try to convey this information as the Catholic Church has done. You know, the, uh, at, at a time when 99.9% you know, .9 of the people in the world were completely illiterate, uh, and didn't even move more than 50 miles from the place they were born, that they developed an entire set of ways of trying to communicate some of the more subtle dimensions of reality uh, to people, but then got trapped in them. They got trapped in those institutions. They got trapped in those belief systems. They became uh, arbitrary dogmas that they then attempted to foist upon people and punish people for not believing them, etc. We have to be extremely careful ab about this that, uh, that we, we have to see that this particular, and we, we are not going to want to demean people who are in a different, a different one of these worldviews, because as I said, it's, it's important to remember that while every single one of these chakras that is connected to every single one of these worldviews has its own particular primary color, from red, yellow, green, blue, uh, indigo, and violet, that the fact is, if you take every one of those primary colors as a laser, and you shine it onto one single point, the mutual interference patterns that are set up among them generate white light. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a metaphor that I think we need to keep in mind here. It is not a matter of repressing uh, these aspects of our human, our human nature. It's a matter of get, keeping them in balance so that we can evolve and develop and open on to the higher levels of consciousness that are available to us, this is the pathway to partnership with those that abide at the, at the octave above us and the octave above that. Uh, this, is, this is, in my opinion, what the, the major dynamic is of us. That this is the, if you will, secret of life. Uh, this is the, the, the task that we're all engaged in here as potential architects of the new paradigm. This is, in my opinion, what the architecture looks like. Uh, uh, people, people probably ask, you know, wh what is a trial lawyer doing here, uh, <laughs> uh, ta talking, talking about this? Uh, uh, but it, it just that I, I've, I've, you know, been engaged, as people have pointed out, in a number of the major issues of the day, and I've tried to, to develop and, and explore these realms so I can be helpful to the maximum possible degree to our human family just like I, I try to be with the jury when I'm trying to explain to the jury what the issue is that we're dealing with here in our community now and that you've got to rise up and address this. And you've come here, this is a self-selecting group uh, that has come here together because the, the meme uh, and concept of the architecture of a new paradigm is appealing to you. And so I want to be able to just share with you what my own opinion is about what this architecture looks like in my opinion so that we can understand how we go about helping to participate in this and what the questions are that we need to help provide answers to and what the process is by means of which we might help our sisters and brothers all participate so that we prepare ourselves to make love with those who are waiting. Uh, okay, so that's, that's uh, my preliminary remarks. Uh, we have some time left that you can ask some questions. Uh, 
that uh, I imagine there are a few. <laughs> why, 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 why don't we just start over here from the back and work our way right up, and then we'll come right over here. We'll go back and forth. How did they sh shoehorn Richard Nixon into an SR-71 Blackbird? <laughs> well, a actually, because they, they each, e the, 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 qu the question is, how did they shoehorn Richard Nixon into an SR-71 Blackbird? Uh, they actually had two of them. Uh, and Kissinger was in one, and Nixon was in the other. Uh, and they had two SR-71s, and they, they were flying together in tandem, uh, masked uh, from radar and went into China to hold the meetings there and then flew into uh, to Riyadh and uh, had the meetings there and then actually went to see the Shah of Iran uh, in Iran. They actually made this deal uh, with both of them to authorize them to increase the price of, of uh, oil uh, from a uh, dollar, uh, from 42 cents uh, a gallon at the pump to a dollar 42. Uh, and it's a long, a long and involved story. I'll, t I'll tell you about it later. But it's, but it, it's, uh, it's like one of those stories of, you know, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? Uh, and if we, start, if we start down that line, we'll lose, uh, lose control of, uh, I think, a, a higher conversation that I think we need to have. So let's just go back and, let's go back and forth, Lori. To Hi. Um, at the risk of being too simplistic, this um, eighth octave. Eighth paradigm worldview, yes. <laughs> It just occurs to me that we're supposed to have all this junk DNA that no one can decide what it's about. And perhaps that would awaken at the appropriate time that we evolved. And, and, and not only that, but there, there are a lot of studies that are being done that actually indicate that we're able to actually generate changes in our own DNA, you know, through, through a conscious attention. There's actual self-genetic engineering that, that we can do. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of promise in, in these areas. I, w I want to acknowledge you for really such mastery of this because mastery is a function of having so many distinctions and you have an enormous number of distinctions. Yeah, there, there are a number of distinctions here. That's <laughs> I'm, here. I, I'm a little bit like the Hawaiian whose distinctions for snow, not like the Eskimo with 32. I got one, wet, you know, that's it. So. <laughs> As you said, we have to be careful. And when I speak with my children and my grandchildren and my neighbors, I'm faced with a situation where if I talk about paradigm, they say, I, isn't that pronounced paradigm? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Or if I say, oh, it's a worldview. Oh, that I know about. I saw that picture of Earth, mm -hmm. you see. And so I, 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 I don't dare do eight. I've, I've just got two. And my suggestion it's the closest thing I can bring it down and boil it to, that we live right now in a world of you or me, based on competition and based on the idea that we're separate and based on the idea there's shortages, and that the world that we hope to transform into and we intend to is a world of you and me, which just doesn't necessarily include people, but include the wall and the rocks and the sea and the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the best I, I can do in talking with people who don't have even those two distinctions. Okay. Would you comment on that? Well, what, as, as I say, I, I think that the important thing to try to communicate, and there, there is the tactical task of figuring out how to explain this to people who spend less time thinking about it, less time reading about it, et cetera, uh, uh, without frightening them or offending them. Uh, and, and this is part of the task that we have as architectures of the new paradigm. That, but, but, you know, the old saying is, you know, I, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. Uh, that, you know, you need, you need, to, you need to have a kind of a, an in-depth, comprehensive understanding of the issue itself in order to simplify it. And that's what we're all working on together. We're working on the kind of more sophisticated, complex, understanding of what the topography is of the worldviews and what the architecture of a worldview looks like and what this new paradigm worldview may look like. Uh, and so we're, that's what we're engaged in trying to do. And uh, we understand that it's frustrating when your next door neighbor asks you, what were you doing this weekend? Uh, and you try to explain it to them. Uh, and that we all have to help each other out on figuring out how we end up having different levels of being able to explain this we have to develop what is similar to like an old Sufi poem. You know, the, the, Sufi, the Sufi poems and the Sufi stories all have about three or four different levels of operation. 
so that you can tell the story to different people and they all hear it in slightly different ways. Uh, and that's, that's, why, that's why some of the prophets always just talk in paradigms, or excuse me, in these parables. They just lay out the story and that uh, those who have ears to hear and eyes to see can hear it and see it. And others understand it to a little lesser degree, but it all, all moves people in the right direction. And that's, that's what we have to do together, I think. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to really appreciate how you suggested that rather than trying to change the paradigm, but to level it up. Yeah. That was really insightful. The other thing um, I want to more ask about is like in seven and eight paradigms, it's very dis descriptive of what people have shared when they've been in a near-death experience, mm -hmm. especially the eight, you know, um, is just all is one and, and so yeah, forth. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if we could kind of bring that more into our life without having to die, <laughs> you know. Oh, yes, and, and, that's, and that's the secret. That's the secret, in my opinion, of, the, of what the mystics are trying to tell you, you know, that you can sit down, you know, in 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night and, and do the breathing. You, you can do the deep breathing uh, in there. And it doesn't take an awful lot of additional training to know how to do it in the kind of most simple sort of transcendental meditation type of ways. And what you start to discover is sort of like doing Tai Chi. After you've been practicing the Tai Chi exercises for a matter of a couple of months, you start to discern this whole energy field around your body. It kind of swishes and moves with you when you move and stuff. And you can eventually get to the point where it actually functions as a shield that you can work with. Uh, the same thing is true with the meditation, is that, it, that as, you, as you just do it, it starts out being extremely frustrating. You're sitting there saying, you know, oh, look, I, I'm wasting my time. I've got to do the laundry. I've, I've got to go to the store. You know, I've got to write this brief. You know, but, but the fact is, if you stay with it and you do the breathing with just some simple mantras uh, to keep your attention, focus so you don't fall asleep or drift off, you know, that, that, that what you start to discover is that there is a way of being. There is a way of being that is more and more and more unconditioned, that you actually find yourself sitting in the same exact position that many thousands of us have over the centuries and experiencing the same secret of this quiet place. And it's from that quiet place that you have the perspective to be able to get some perspective on your normal physical inclinations uh, that are driving you uh, and that, that you can then have that little space between your instant reflexive response to uh, these other stimuli and just reflect upon it and then come to this higher place. Uh, th that's, it's an it's a open secret uh, and it's a, the, one of the most important secrets that anyone can ever learn and it's always astonishing to all of us as to why we don't do it more, you know. <laughs> but but it's there, it's there for us. I think, yeah, yeah. Without having to die, it's okay. practicing dying in a certain way. Thank you, Danny. Um, question: I was conceived in one place and born in another. So should my chart uh, reflect the place I was conceived, or the place I was born? It, it would, in my opinion, you'd have to ask an astrologer that, but I think that it would really be where the maximum percentage of your gestation actually occurred, because that's the one that's going to be the, the confluence of tractor forces that were actually operative on uh, you as a zygote for the maximum amount of time. So I don't think it's the exact instant of conception. I think it's where you were actually subjected to those kind of oceanic experiences in the womb. Okay, and with that, uh, moving from uh, making love to being in the womb, uh, yeah, yes, we one need more. To, we need to. I, I can stand up and talk loudly. And we're out of time, so if you could be brief, that would okay. be great. But not out of total time. Okay. Go ahead.
seventh and eighth worldview. How do we bring paradox? How do we bring unity and diversity? How do we bring all of these things into language? Right? Well, that was a yeah, right. I'll, I'll yeah. That uh, you know. That, that it's, it's, actually, it's actually in the meditation that you learn, you come to discern those things. You develop a kind of a higher frequency state of consciousness, and then when it comes time to trying to share your insights, which many people are your essentially ineffable, uh, that you can get closer and closer to this type of a meaningful expression to people. But, you know, I remember the, the, the first thing that Pir Nasser Allah Shah ever said to me uh, when I first met him, of one of the many that I've had a, a great blessing to be able to meet at different times, he just he he just looked at me and he went. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, guys.